Vlad the Impaler, the famous voivode of Wallachia from 1446 to 1477, known of course for the brutal intolerance of his enemies and criminals alike. His method of execution was death by impalement. Vlad the Impaler is a national hero of Romania and his life, like the rest of Transylvania, is steeped in superstition and folklore. Perhaps there is more to Vlad's choice of execution than mere fear-mongering. What if there is a specific reason for impalement that was practical, though no less violent, in keeping the order and health of his people? Although modern fiction depicts Vlad as a blood-drinking vampire, the historical Vlad was likely inspired by Romanian superstition to purge his land and the very evil thought to be festering in his lands, the vampirism rampant through Transylvania parasites. Vlad the Impaler was a religious Orthodox Christian belonging to the same order of chivalric knights that his father was a high-ranking member of, the Order of the Dragon. Founded in 1408 by Sigismund of Luxembourg, who was king of Hungary and would later become the Holy Roman Emperor, he established it for the purpose of protecting the royal families, defending against enemies, and fighting heretics. Vlad's father wore the emblem of the dragon, and the name Dracul would be associated with the family. So contrary to the fiction, Dracul wasn't a name denoting their evil, but one that pitted them against the superstitious belief of demonic and draconic enemies. The Order of the Dragon was inspired by an older order of knights, the Order of St. George, the Dragon Slayer. St. George the Dragon Slayer is the Christian iteration of a popular theme across many cultures the triumphant hero slaying a terrible dragon. There's Horus on horseback slaying Set in crocodile form. The Romans used the Draco standard for one of their cavalry regimes. The Greek used Thracian horsemen with a serpent entwined tree. Apollo and the Aesopius, Marduk and Tiamat, Ra and Epepi, Siegfried and Fafnir, Michael and Satan, Indra, Zeus, Perseus, Heracles, Beowulf, Erlang, Shen, Lancelot, are all examples of dragon slayers in mythology, folklore, and religion, along with many more. It's such a common motif that I believe it suggests something subconscious and natural to life, that any culture at any time can experience and develop, as is the case here. Dragons symbolize parasites in the body, hence why the word worm is closely associated with serpents, leviathans, and dragons. It's a universal motif because every culture has to deal with parasites and worms in some way. But understanding Vlad's motivations requires some understanding of Transylvanian and Romanian folklore and superstition. Romania is a heavily forested region, and forests play a central role to the beliefs of the Romanians who mixed pre-Christian traditions with their Orthodox religion. Transylvania means the land beyond the forest. Many of their beliefs read like neurotic superstition, on certain days they couldn't farm, and on others were the only days they could get married. Certain everyday household tasks, like sewing, could only be done on certain days of the week. Feast days all had particular rules to them, and there were rituals and remedies for every ill-omened event and ways of thanking every positive outcome. Spirits and fairies and their famous vampires, called the Strigoi, as well as werewolves, stalked the land and inhabited the forests. They prayed and asked for forgiveness with every tree cut down, as they believed the trees to have souls. There were caves and mountains said to be the homes of evil spirits, and the forest was crawling with creatures that made their way to the towns and cities of Romania. On St. George's Day, occurring May 5th, one of the most important feast days to the Romanians, probably similar to our Halloween in terms of its supernatural association, the sky opens up and all the trees can flower, this was a time of heightened witchcraft, so extra caution was advised. It was also a night in which treasure could be found, as mystical energy would reveal the location of special treasures and precious metals. Curiously, the legend goes that one could eat moldy bread for the entire year preceding the Feast of St. George, and have their vision enhanced so as to see the energy emanating from the treasure that night. If one can survive the diet, they will be rich and long-lived. Unbaptized and newborn babies are carefully watched over lest the Strigoi devour them. The Strigoi would become the vampire of modern fiction, but is a motif common throughout the world. 
The Roman iteration of the night creatures comes from the dead, who rose again to feast on the blood of the living. In some cases, it just referred to any evil witch or sorcerer or an evil spirit. The name Strigoi means something like Screech Owl, which is the same as the Lilitu of Babylonian folklore, and similar to the Greek harpies and many other winged night succubi, or vampiric archetype creatures. They could be invisible or take the form of animals. There were actually several types of Strigoi, depending if it was a living or undead or just a spirit, sometimes depicted as either old crones or beautiful women who could seduce their victims or steal children and kill babies, which is very similar to the Lilitu. The main remedy is, as we know, garlic. Garlic is eaten constantly, placed in windows, and hung in doorways to repel the Strigoi. A suspected Strigoi would have the deceased person's grave dug up, beheaded, and garlic placed in its mouth, or have a wooden stake driven through its chest. Beech wood was important for Romanian superstition. Branches were placed in various parts of the house to protect against the undead, and coffins were built with beech for the same reasons. Oak and fir trees are two other important trees in Romanian folklore used in everyday appliances and religious icons. As we commonly see, evil spirits are personified diseases and illnesses microorganisms and neurotoxins and mycotoxins and parasites. Their proximity to forests means there is a strong likelihood for increased exposure to all of the above. The strigoi are some variety of parasites or fungal infections. Children are especially susceptible to infections. The strigoi like to target children and lure them away. Parasites transfer hosts after the host dies, accounting for the undead aspect of it all. Many mental degenerative disorders and the elderly likely account for the old crone superstitions, as parasites can take over the host's mind in severely weakened states, such as in old age. Things like dementia or similar types of neurohacking. Parasites can also lead to night terrors, sex dreams, teeth chattering, and other nighttime anomalies. This along with howling winds, screeching owls, and mycotoxins blowing in, as well as increased parasite activity at night makes for the common and universal motifs and folk creatures that terrorize humans. The sex dreams are probably where the inspiration for the undead being depicted as seductresses come from. Parasites can infect and hack more than just humans. Dogs and cats and other wildlife and livestock can all be infected similarly and lead to behavior, changes, aggression, and anomalous activity seen as an evil sign or of possession. The idea behind this is that parasites and fungal pathogens are intelligent and can influence hosts in conscious ways, setting up circumstances such as a child being led from home at night, or a man going insane and attacking people. One of the main reasons to suspect microbes and parasites in the identification of personified superstition is their remedies. While in many cases the invisible and unexplained events were remedied with seemingly as equally bizarre counters like not baking bread on Fridays or misfortunes can befall you. Many of these can be subconscious or even recognized patterns of cause and effects from a population or area with heavy parasite load. Subconscious problems are recognized, and this leads to ritualistic behavior to fix the issue. We see this in modern society in the exact same way. Humans are still humans. Neurotic behavior and routines are just as common, and the belief that they can influence the outcome is just as prevalent. The chief difference is we are no longer as reliant on each other as a community, so most of those are personal and not communal rituals. But the use and obsession of garlic tells us they correctly found a strong counter to the pathogens. Garlic is a powerful antifungal, antiparasite, and antibacterial. Central to the themes of vampires is sunlight destroys them, a known antiparasitic and antifungal source. It makes sense to place garlic on undead persons' heads, or to hang it in the house, and especially to eat it. They were still dealing with largely invisible forces, but it is not a coincidence that garlic fights off vampires. Silver is another antimicrobial that can kill vampires and werewolves in the folk legends. But what of stakes? It goes to reason that they used their most religious woods to fight the draconic spirits infesting their deceased. Woods like fir, beech, and oak, all with known antiseptic abilities. Of course, any tree has to develop its own defense system against parasites and microbes, 
and often those same bark or leaf or resin extracts can be used beneficially for humans. It's because of their medicinal and antimicrobial properties that they were given religious significance, that they believed the wood can protect against death and disease, and of course to kill a vampire. If we can make estimations on a culture's environmental pathogen level based on the kind of superstitions and everyday life struggles and their supplementary rituals, along with what we know of a given ecosystem, a forest, for example, can have many parasites, fungus, and bacteria transferred by many types of insects and animals and on the food. These pathogens account for the strange fears, bizarre behaviors, and even the decline of a community's health, such as an increase in crime, murder, rape, and just a degeneration of society due to parasite load in parts of Romania. Then perhaps Vlad the Impaler's choice of execution makes sense. If criminal and violent behavior within the community is attributed to evil spirits and possession, a religious issue, and the way to cleanse those evil spirits is by things like garlic and wood, then impalement could have been effective in stopping the spread of parasites, as they would not have had the ground to go back into. The impalement went from the intestines up and through. It could have legitimately stopped the spread of parasites and crime beyond just the psychological level. Impalement is an old form of execution, and maybe there is a subconscious methodology behind it, or even one with observed benefits for the community. Thanks for watching.